University from Sweden. And he's a coordinator of EU-funded research project reInvent, realizing innovation in transition for decarbonization. Thank you, Arina. Yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, an engineer by training, engineering physics, and then I've drifted into uh, energy systems analysis, energy policy analysis, uh, governance studies, uh, which to me is really hard science. Uh, <laughs> but who are you? Are you? How many academics in the room? A bunch of academics. How many are sort of in the policy circles? Okay, and those who, of you who are not academics or in policy? Business? Yeah. Industry? Yeah. Okay, good, thank you. Lawyers. By the way, Paul has a great paper on how much of the fossil fuels that must stay in the ground, right? It's quite a lot. It's, yeah, it's, that's stranded assets for you. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about uh, reInvent and, and the questions we got. Uh, so maybe first the questions, uh, again revisited, and my, my answers are, are quite short. You know, can we reconcile this? Decarbonization with uh, various political objectives, yes, absolutely, why not? Uh, we have been looking at uh, basic materials industry, the emissions intensive industry, and even, even in those very tough sectors, uh, it's possible. Um, and I think science has a lot to contribute and can say a lot, and, and Paul also spoke to that. Uh, uh, related to innovation and deployment, financing, we talked about, uh, yeah, we talked about all those things already. <laughs> uh, Reinvent very quickly at a glance. Uh, so uh, post Paris uh, is certainly a new context, uh, but even before that, the two degree goal, discussing the one and a half de degree, degree goal, is a different playing field because it means that everybody has to go to zero emissions. So we, we, do, we need not have a debate on where it's cheaper to reduce emissions. We need strategies across all sectors, uh, which partly motivated us also to look, let's see, um, look at uh, basic industries and the meat and dairy sectors. Uh, the basic approach in our project is to sort of work from within the sectors and have a bottom-up inside perspective on possible pathways for these sectors. Historically, we've had a lot of policy analysis evaluating the European trading scheme, evaluating feed-in tariffs and quota obligations. But to understand the transition pathways, we think we need get, to get into inside the sectors and work closely with them. And uh, so the purpose is to assess uh, viability and, and uh, the governance of, of pathways in, in these key sectors. Um, also work closely with them and use this project as a platform for dialogue or co-creation if you, if you like. Um, there. Uh, I won't bore you with the details of the different work packages. Uh, we have specifically, we're looking at steel, plastics, paper, and the meat and dairy uh, sectors. We're a fairly uh, small team. Um, five institutions, uh, a mix of people from uh, engineering, uh, economics, geographers, modelers, and political science, uh, working on those issues. Um, when I, when I talk to these uh, social scientists and economists uh, and we're looking at this problem, I, I try to sometimes go back to the very basics. What is it that we have to work with uh, when we're on this, on this planet? And uh, when working with industry and basic industry, that everything is not a social construct, but there's something basic we can know about the future. We, we're expecting to still have the periodic table of elements. Uh, we're expecting that the sun continues to shine. So the good news here is that we, we have a very ample energy resource that we can use to create those more circular and sustainable economies of, of material flows. So, you know, basically the, the resource conditions are there. It's technically possible 
So it boils down to, to a policy and governance issue at the end. Um, if we look at industry specifically, and materials and decarbonization, we have different types of materials that we need in society. It's metals, it's various minerals uh, for producing glass and PV cells, and we have organic compounds. That could be plastics, it could be uh, paper uh, with biogenic origin. And a relatively short list of uh, options to reduce emissions through emissions efficiency in the basic uh, conversion steps. So we can have carbon capture and storage, we can have bio-based feedstock, we all know that's a scarce resource. Uh, we can have electricity, so electrification is becoming a big thing, because when you think about it long term and 100% renewable energy, you do get electricity as your primary electricity carrier. And you want to use that directly if possible, and if not, you can produce hydrogen, you can use that to balance the grid, etc. The difficult part uh, about these industries is that there are few, if any, co-benefits. So if we look at sustainable cities, sustainable transport, we have all these co-benefits and, and uh, things that improve at the same time as we do climate mitigation. But in this case, we don't have that really. Um, you still produce the, more, the same materials, but they become more expensive. But, you know, is that a problem? In most products, the, the price, the cost of the material as the share of the product price is very, very small. So I would argue we could, we could afford three times more expensive plastics, no problem. There's a Finnish guy out there in the exhibition. Did, did anyone visit him? He, he, made a, he made a small candle from solar electricity and carbon dioxide. So he captured the carbon dioxide from the air, he took solar electricity, he reacted with hydrogen, fischer tropsch and, and uh, did, a, did a candle. So it's, it's doable. Now his candle was extremely expensive, of course, <laughs> because it, it was lab scale. Potentially a large electricity user. Um, I'll show you, this is just one example. So I think this is interesting also, how, how industry and companies change their perceptions. We've seen it in the energy industry, clearly how companies like Aon change their strategy, they split the company, and it's moving into these other sectors now. So in Sweden we have the example of the steel industry. This came one year ago. This is how the steel industry can become fossil free. It's the uh, mining company, the energy company, and the steel company, SSAB. Um, and they have this idea that, uh, listen, maybe we don't need uh, coal and coke anymore. We can uh, produce iron ore pellets, uh, use hydrogen to reduce the iron ore, get the sponge iron and, and water as a byproduct, and then put that into the electric arc furnaces. So it's perfectly doable. Uh, and this is a project which is now starting up. And, um, it's not, it's not a research project. They are really aiming to develop this process, making a pilot in the next few years, scaling it up in 2025, 2030, uh, going ahead. Um, the basic industries have some specific characteristics and histories of innovation, which also makes this a, a bit more difficult. It's capital intensive with long investment cycles and scale economies. They don't have a, a, a history of, of uh, you know, breakthrough fundamental innovations. It's more incremental, more focused on products. Uh, difficult markets, often very cyclic, with small margins for bulk commodities. So, um, a history of public policy that has basically sheltered those industries rather than pushing them. Uh, so, uh, you know, you get exemptions and you get a uh, free uh, allocation of emission allowances, etc. Um, so we have a lot of lock-in in, in these sectors, but I think it's high time to start working with them if we want to, you know, reach, make, it. we have to start now if we want to make investments in 2040, 2050, that's the kind of timeline you have in this, in this uh, context. Um, summing up, what you need is direction. Um, you know Yogi Berra? 
Uh, he's the guy that produced a lot of quotes. He was a coach for the, for the New York Yankees. He said that you, you have to be careful if you don't know where, where you're going, because you might not get there. And that, it's, it's very simple. You need direction. You need, you need to know where you're going. Uh, Paul talked about the need for innovation, system innovation, so it's not only technology, we need to create market pools for these, and, and you also talked about the, the, the changes we need in, in institutions. We need to ensure deployment, and there's a tricky area here about uh, risk sharing and financing, and how do you share that between, between industry and, and governments. Uh, what we've seen in, in renewable energy, for example, in, in, in Germany with feed-in tariffs, is that you create very safe investment conditions for investors. Can we do the same with industry, or is it too difficult? Uh, we need international policy coherence. Uh, we talked about more expensive materials. Um, so that's something that has to develop. And it requires a lot of institutional capacity, which is maybe not uh, really in sync with, uh, with what we've seen in recent years and decades uh, in, in, um, in public management. Um, that we really build in long-term expertise and capacity uh, in the institutions that govern. Um, and I think that's all I had, so thank you very much. Thank you.